Well, you know, last week we kind of kicked off a new series uh, reflecting on the fact that we will get cut in life. And I just want to ask you if maybe this week did you feel cut? Did you feel wounded? Maybe emotionally or relationally, maybe physically or financially or, or spiritually even, where there were wounds that were infected or, or, or wounds that were inflicted upon you. Because the reality is in different seasons of life, when we're wounded, we always bleed. When we're wounded from an emotional, relational, f- spiritual sense, oftentimes we either bleed criticism and whining and complaining or we bleed promises of God, clinging to Him, clinging to promises bigger than what we're capable of, knowing that even our God can use our wounds for some pretty amazing things. We're diving into the book of Acts, which chronicles the origin story of the church, really the birth of the church of Jesus and the original apostles that God was using mightily to lead this massive movement into the future. And in the middle of all the joy they were experiencing as the church was growing, exploding in growth, multiplying, people coming to faith in Jesus day by day by day. I mean, it was just incredibly overwhelming and amazing, and yet it was incredibly difficult too because the resistance and oppression they were feeling was growing and growing and growing at the same time. Society looked at the church of Jesus, what they, what initially they called themselves followers of the way. They looked at the followers of the way society did, and they, they saw them as a gift to their environment. But those in power saw these Jesus followers as a threat because they were gaining such massive amounts of influence at such a rapid pace. And they thought their culture, their own personal culture, might be changed by these Jesus followers. So we arrive at chapter 6 and 7 of the book of Acts, and the church has now become a major movement, especially in the city of Jerusalem. Scholars tell us that around this point, as we arrive at chapter 6 and 7 of Acts, uh, the, church, the, the church of Jesus is probably 10,000 people in the city of Jerusalem, which is a city of only forty to 50,000 people at this moment in history. So this is one out of four, one out of five people uh, claim to, to follow Jesus Christ. This is a significant thing that's happened in such a short amount of time. Now we know, looking back on history, <coughs> that the church will go global. The gospel of Jesus will go global. But the question at this moment is, how has it grown so fast? Why? Like, what empowered such a massive, quick, explosive growth? Well, there's a, a history professor at Yale uh, who's, who's written and, and captured many historical things, Kenneth Latourette. And, and he's quoted in one of his historical records of 2,000 years ago in the early church. He says, never in so short a time has any other religious faith or for that many matter, any other set of ideas, religious, political, or economic, ever achieved so commanding a position <coughs> in such an important culture without the aid of physical force or social or cultural prestige. So he's basically saying other movements spread by military conquest or they spread by political power, but not Christianity in the first century. It was a grassroots peasants and up movement, unlike anything they'd seen before or we've seen since in human history. So how, why, why did this occur? What was, what was the gas powering the engine? Well, we know from a faith standpoint, the Holy Spirit was really the engine driving it forward. But see, the Holy Spirit only uses yielded yielded vessels in which to transport the power of God. And so we know that there were a group of people known as the early Christians across the first century that were filled with a boldness and a courage to declare, declare the truth of what they witnessed with their own eyes, these Christians. But intertwined with that boldness and courage was this conviction and faith in the person of Jesus that they would not withdraw from, they would not compromise on, they would not pull back from. It didn't matter how much pressure was applied, they would not deny what they had seen, what they had experienced. Last week I shared with you about a man named Stephen. Stephen was a normal everyday guy who overnight, overnight kind of became an inspiring catalytic figure for the early church. And I want to talk a little bit more this week about his story. At the beginning of Acts chapter 6, we see the church multiplying like crazy. And the people that are a part of the church, the, the earliest disciples and the apostles as well, are realizing something. They're realizing that they have to make some changes to the structure of the church for this growth they've experienced to be compensated for. There, there's so many more people coming to Christ that the way in which the church began needed to be adjusted 
so that the growth could continue. And so in verse 1 of chapter 6, after Luke, a doctor, done all this research, done all this Q&A, captured all the data, he's writing the book of Acts, and in chapter 6, verse 1, he says, Now, in these days, when the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint by the Hellenists... Now, the Hellenists uh, in the early church were basically... They were Jewish people with Greek cultural uh, roots. So, so they were Hebrew, but they came from the Greek influence. And that would have been different from the Hebrews that were very devout in their Hebrew origin. So the Hellenists rose against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. Now, if you were reading the book of Acts, you'd probably just read through that and say, okay, whatever that means. That was the early church. Wow, the church was growing like crazy. You move right on to verse 2. But if you do that, you really miss the context of what's happening there, which is very relevant to where we find ourselves in our culture today. The first thing we kind of see right here is there is a racial conflict within the early church. Like sometimes we think when we look back at the early church, like they had it down, like it was perfect and that's what the church should be and everybody loved each other and they were meeting each other's needs, selling things and no one had any needs. No, right here early on in chapter 6, like this isn't that long after the day of Pentecost, all of a sudden there's this bubbling up of dialogue that this group of people is unhappy with this group of people. They're complaining that one racial group was getting escalated or more valuable, that's what they felt, than another group. Like there was somebody that was kind of getting looked over. So there was like an ethnic conflict. The second thing we see in this first verse is that nobody had the courage or awareness to bring this to the apostles. So gossip was happening in these back channels. Because it kind of, I mean Luke himself says, a complaint kind of arose. (coughs) A complaint by the Hellenists kind of arose. It's not like so-and-so came before the apostles and shared with them a concern. There's no name. There's no moment in time. It's just like at some point they discovered there was a group of people that were unhappy, but nobody had come to them and talked about their unhappiness. And so gossip was happening. It bubbled to the surface because people were talking. Do You know, nothing can destroy a church or your relationships faster than unchecked gossip. If someone ever approaches you to talk about someone who's not present or something that they're not a part of, but they have negative things to say about it, I want to give you permission. In fact, I want to to challenge you. If you know Jesus, you have an obligation to cut them off say, hey, you need to stop right now. You need to go talk to that person. This is not honoring God, us continuing to have this conversation when that person's not here or the person you're talking about. We can't change that outcome unless you go talk to them. And sometimes we like to use the excuse, well, I'm just venting, I'm just getting off my chest. No, this is not, this is not a biblical way God has given us to, to handle these kinds of scenarios. If you have a concern about something or someone in your life, go directly to the source. Don't go around the person to somebody else. Don't go beneath that person. And this happens often, oftentimes in the professional world, right? We don't like something the boss or somebody higher up, so there's gossip happening within the, the office or within the department or within the team about that person, but nobody has the courage to go talk to that person. So don't talk to somebody beneath. Don't jump ahead and talk to somebody above that person to get them in trouble or to try to address it that way. That's manipulative. No, in fact, if you ever have a question about how do you handle something that's bothering you, a concern or an issue or a hurt that you have, turn to Matthew chapter 16. Jesus walks through step by step by step. How do we handle hurts? How do we address concerns that we have go directly to the person? If that doesn't work, if we feel we haven't been listened to, if we feel they haven't acted on it, if we feel it's still a concern, then Jesus walks us through step by step in Matthew chapter 16. So how did the church leaders respond in this specific scenario where the Hellenists were, this complaint arose among them? Well, they attacked it head on. In in chapter 6 verse 2, the very next verse, Luke says, And the twelve, twelve original apostles, summoned the full number of the disciples... And said, it is not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. Now, you could read that initially as kind of a prideful statement. Okay, so the 12 apostles feel like they, should, they need to preach the word because that's better than serving the tables. No, that's not the original text. That's an assumption that you're making. Catch what they said. It's not right we should give up the preaching of the word to continue to serve tables. That's the nature of what was happening. Through chapters 1 through 6, up to this moment, the apostles have been serving the widows. But because the massive growth of the church was continuing, it was growing exponentially, now their amount of time they were spending serving tables was beginning to take away from the time that they needed to begin to preach the word and instruct people 
with, with what were their, their next steps spiritually. So therefore, they, give the, they kind of delegate a task to the other disciples. The 12 apostles say, Therefore, brothers, pick out from among you seven men of good repute, reputation, full of the Spirit, full of wisdom, who we will appoint to this duty. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And what they said pleased the whole gathering. So their approach and their decision, their delivery, everybody's like, yeah, that's a good idea. You know, the apostles knew that their role as defined by Jesus was as servants. I mean, think about it. They're, they're following a man who not very long before this was on his knees washing their feet. And they believed he was the son of the living God, God himself. So if you miss somehow that the guy you're following was here to serve when he had just washed your feet, then you've completely spaced out. They had been waiting the tables for the widows and everybody else that was in need, but the church was growing and this feeding task was becoming too much for the apostles to be assigned that ministry. And it was an opportunity for them to share the ministry with a whole other generation. So when they realized this, that it would consume their time and that the greatest act of service God had called them to is to preach the word, and to pray, and then to raise up other people to do the same, they're not graduating out of serving the food, but they're focusing on just the most effective way to invest their time so that this movement could continue. They still have the same number of hours in a day or a week that everybody else has, but the demands of the ministry has outpaced their available extra time to do it. So they turn to that new generation, and they appoint to the task of serving the widows. And they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and full of the Holy Spirit. Now, they run through the list of the other six, but I really want to just stay focused on Stephen. In verse 6, Luke tells us, These they set before the apostles, and they prayed and laid their hands on them. So the disciples presented them to the twelve. The twelve approved. They laid hands, and they gave them an empowerment to lead this area of ministry. And the word of God, now here's the result of this step of wise leadership. The word of God continued to increase. Now the 12 apostles were free to preach more, to declare the truth more, to tell the stories about Jesus more, and to pray more, and to raise up other people that could go and do the same, not only in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria, but to the uttermost parts of the world. The word of God continued to increase, and the number of disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. Now, that's a significant statement Luke is bringing to the surface. What he's saying is that Hebrew priests were also converting to Christianity. They were saying, yes, that Jesus was the Messiah. You know, the mission of the church is to reach new people and then disciple them, invest in their lifelong development as we are invested in lifelong development of following Jesus. And when a lot of people are reached in a short amount of time, growth happens. But things have to change in order for us to continue to see the mission expand. We've been talking about that over the last month and a half with this multiplication vision. What we've seen God do here at Fusion, opening doors for that to happen in other places. So a group of guys like Stephen are identified as great candidates to be assigned this privilege of serving. After all, Jesus himself said, I came not to serve, not to be served, but to serve and to give my life as a ransom for many. And so the disciples were following that, that method. They were continuing forward that same command Jesus says, as the Father sent me to serve, now I'm sending you to serve. Stephen is an ordinary, normal guy at this point. He's one of the disciples, one of the many. But Stephen is definitely anointed. He's been assigned what would many would say from the outside looking in as a simple, meaningful duty, but simple in feeding of people in need, especially widows. And yet God is giving him opportunities through this new role to be used for great kingdom impact. This reminds me of many who are a part of Fusion here who serve in roles that we may not even notice half the time. Because they can even be behind the scenes. People like up there in the booth we don't think about until something goes crazy and then we turn and stare at them, right? Or the people that uh, all of a sudden we come in and we're ready for a cup of coffee and there's coffee. And oftentimes we just don't think about the people that get here early and prepare the coffee or the, the cookies and them slaving in a hot kitchen yesterday or this afternoon at 2.30 to get those cookies here, right? Like we don't think about And that is a profoundly helpful way to serve the church, to use your gifts and abilities. In fact, I would encourage you, if you're not actively a part of what God is doing here at Fusion and serving your, your, your brothers and sisters in Christ in some way, don't leave tonight without an expressing, hey, how can I be a part 
of supporting what's going on here. Because Jesus came to serve, and I follow Jesus, therefore he's called me to serve as well. Acts 6 reminds us that in the kingdom of Jesus, God can use any humble, willing heart. In verse 8, Luke tells us, Stephen, full of grace and power, was doing great wonders and signs among the people. Then some of those who belonged to the synagogue of the freedmen, as it was called, and of the Cyrenians and of the Alexandrians and of those from Cilicia and Asia, rose up and disputed with Stephen. But they could not withstand the wisdom and the spirit with which he was speaking. I mean, basically, Stephen's having these isolated conversations with people from other places that are there in Jerusalem. And these isolated conversations with Stephen and people trying to dispute what he's saying about Jesus and they're from other Jewish synagogues and other locations. All of a sudden, Stephen finds himself detained, arrested, and placed before a tribunal of Hebrew religious leaders. I mean, you can almost see it as if he was here standing on the floor and then there's this, you know, these massive rows of chairs of people that are going to intimidate him and, and try, to, try to force him to, to remain silent. Now, up till now in the book of Acts, what we see is them arresting groups of people and presenting them before a, 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 an audience like this. Now they've brought one person alone to try and scare him and intimidate him. It's almost as if they have a new approach to try to squelch the spread of this gospel of Jesus. And in the course of, of chapter 7 of the book of Acts, Stephen preaches a sermon. He, he, he's right there on the floor, and all these Jewish religious leaders and scholars, the great thinkers of his time, the religious leaders of the church, the, 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 of the, the synagogues and the temple at that time, all of a sudden he's declaring to them the truth about Jesus. And I mentioned last week, if you've never read chapter 7 of Acts, you need to read it. It is a compelling walk from Genesis all the way up to Acts chapter 7 of what God was beginning to prepare and why Jesus is the unique one sent from God to satisfy and fulfill everything God had foretold in the thousands of years leading up to it. But there's basically two main ideas that, that, that Stephen keeps coming back to. The first one is this idea that Israel, you have always resisted and rejected the prophets of God. God sent you, you said you wanted God, and so he would send you these people that would speak for him, and yet you would just ignore them, you would resist them, you would push them away, they'd do signs and wonders, miracles, and yet you were still hesitant and resistant. And the second thing he would say is that, you know, you think the law can save you, but the law can't save you. The law can't save any of us, the law exists to help us see how incredibly broken and messed up we are, that we need a savior that we can't score enough points with God, doesn't matter how much good we do, it can't outweigh, it can't remove the stain or the blemish. It's like getting a stain on a, a piece of clothing, and it doesn't matter if you wash it a million times, the stain isn't going to go anywhere until you accept that blood that's been washed, that washes the stain, the blood of Jesus. He basically says, you've been trying and trying and trying to keep the law, and most of the time you fake it anyways. You act like you're holier than you are. He's like, what you realize when, you're, when, you're try, when God lays out the law, what we're realizing is that we just have a dark heart, an evil heart, and we can't change our heart, but God can through Jesus Christ. And then he ends it. He ends his sermon with just a rousing word of encouragement. Like they would, this would have tickled their ears. They would have been excited to hear this. He says in verse 51, he says, You stiff-necked people uncircumcised in heart and ears, you always resist the Holy Spirit, as your fathers did, so do you. Which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? And they killed those who announced beforehand the coming of the righteous one, Jesus, who you have now betrayed and murdered. You who received the law as delivered by angels and did not keep it. Now when they heard these things, they were enraged and they ground their teeth at him. But Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And he said, behold, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. But they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears like they willfully stopped listening and rushed together at him. Then they cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their garments at the feet of a young man named Saul. And as they were stoning Stephen, he called out, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Falling to his knees, he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin 
against them. When he had said this, he fell asleep. You know, Stephen's life is incredibly inspiring. But I think the closer we get to it and we look at our own, it's quite embarrassing. He was willing to lay down his life joyfully while forgiving his murderers as they're murdering him. Like, if we're honest, we have a hard time forgiving a friend who just said something insensitive to us, and we carry it for months, right? He's being pelted with rocks, and they are angry at him, and he's saying, God, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. I want to touch on just a few things we can learn and take away from Stephen's life. The first thing is the identifying mark of a Christian whose heart has been changed is a heart to serve. Stephen is introduced to us first as a servant. That's why he was elevated to this position of serving the tables where the widows were eating. His job was not glorious. It was food service. He obviously, we know from later on, was a capable leader. He was a gifted theologian because people would debate him and they couldn't, they couldn't get around his spirit and his understanding of scripture. And he was obviously a good preacher. We read that in Acts chapter 7. But he didn't say when they said, okay, Stephen, we want to we wanna ask you to go and serve the widows and the tables. He didn't say, well, you know what, guys, I appreciate that, but, but I need something more in line with my gifts, like something public where I'm speaking or, or where I'm leading or where I'm you know, more, more the center of attention. You know, he didn't say, I need something that has more upward mobility than being in, in the back there serving the food with, with people. Like, that's great. We need people to do that, but I don't think that's for me. No, he didn't say that. His response basically was, well, what does God need and what does the church need? And if you think I can do that, I'm in. Like, sign me up. It's not about me. It's about how can I serve the body of Christ? How can I be a part of what God is doing? Because I'll gladly do it. And that service, although seemingly insignificant from the outside in, was something God was going to use to have a huge effect on the church. For those who are, are serving here at Fusion, like you serve in the evening service, maybe you serve in the morning service, maybe you serve in both, I don't know. I just want to say thank you. Like you, you have committed to make creating a place for people to hear about how much God loves them and how much he accepts us right where we are in the midst of our mess and, and how much he can change our lives. Like You've created an environment and atmosphere of focus on the name of Jesus Christ. And, and, and God would not have blessed us with the fruit we've experienced if it wasn't for your faithfulness to serve. For others, if you say you're a part of Fusion Community Church, I would ask you, what are you waiting for? If you're here, if you're a part of this, if, if God's doing something in your spirit, there are so many ways that you can play a meaningful role in something that you don't have to be anxious or afraid of, but it's, it can match your gifting and hardwiring and skill set. The apostles were servants before they were leaders. They had been waiting the tables for the first five chapters. So when they quit waiting tables, it wasn't because they'd arrived and been, become too important for that. No, they simply found a new place to serve where God had specifically called them into. But see, there's also more to serving than just doing it. Like, we don't just go through the motions and our mind and heart are detached. No, we have to do the right thing with the, for the right reasons, for, with the right motives. And the place where God helps to expose our motives at work is in his word. So the second thing that we see a takeaway from Stephen's life is that nothing was more important to him than the word of God. Nothing is more important to a follower of Jesus than the word of God. And in chapter 7, Stephen preaches the longest recorded sermon in Acts. He dives all the way back many generations into time throughout the history of the Hebrew people, identifying where God was speaking and when people, when people in, in the past had listened to God and when they hadn't listened to God, when they were resistant to God. Where did he get all this information? How did he know all of this? So the only way he could have is if he was listening as the apostles were teaching, is, is if he was diving into the truth of what God had to say about this reality we live in himself. Stephen was an ordinary everyday guy willing to serve food to the widow, widows. What was his motive for serving food to the widows? So the apostles would be freed up to teach other people the word of God even more. So we see this profound value. He says, yes, if I can serve here and create the opportunity for the apostles to have more time and energy to declare the word of God, I'm in. Sign me up. I mean, his priority was for, the, for more and more people to hear the truth about his Savior. And if his service would provide for that to happen, then he was, he was excited about that. But see, it's evident in Acts chapter 7 that he had become a student of the word of God as well. That his heart was aligned, but his mind was aligned as well. And he was ready when the opportunity presented itself to deliver a message about how big the gospel really is. 
So here's my question to you. Have you devoted yourself to the word of God? Like, do you have a hunger that God is nurturing for the truth of who he is and who you are and what he's done? Because as a church, we can kind of prioritize the declaration of the word of God. Like we can set aside 30 or 40 minutes every Sunday for, for a message where we talk about God's word and we try to make it relevant to our lives. And, and we can prioritize that. I can prioritize that as a pastor. But the reality is, if you don't choose to prioritize it in your own life, it's just a waste of time. If you don't nurture a hunger for yourself to grow in your understanding of how big the gospel is and how significant it is, then you're going to be set up for a troubling rest of your life. I mean, a disciple is someone who keeps following Jesus deeper and deeper. And as we follow Jesus closer and closer, it drives us deeper and deeper into the word of God. I mean, you just can't separate the, tr the two because the word of God is where God speaks to us without confusion with, with great clarity, with great specifics about who we are, about who he is and what he's calling us, how he's calling us to live our lives. So are you listening to it, reading it, studying it, chewing on it? What, however you're wired, are you engaging with the word of God? Because like Stephen, there will come a day where you'll be called upon to give an answer for the hope you profess. Someone that's struggling is going to text you a question or, or someone at work is going to pull you aside and ask you about why you live the way you live or how you can deal with the stress you're dealing with. And it will be in a place where, where a pastor or a church leader will not be readily accessible to you. And that's not an, an accident. God wants you to speak into their life from your experience with him. Will your response be filled with scripture or filled with anxiety? See, the Holy Spirit can bring stuff to your memory. He can bring ammunition to your mind. But you have to stock the ammunition ahead of time in the arsenal. The third thing we see in Stephen's life is that God does his greatest work through ordinary people. We're all really ordinary. All of us are. We're all broken. We're all flawed. Nobody's perfect. We're not Jesus. Stephen preaches the longest sermon in the book of Acts with the most powerful and, and, and historical impact. Because there's one guy that was present that day, as Stephen was sharing his testimony, who very soon after that, his life would be changed radically and he would become the most significant catalyst to the future of the church, and that was Saul of Tarsus. Saul was there. He heard Stephen's appeal. He heard Stephen walk through the truth of the gospel. He didn't know he was listening to words that would one day be captured in the New Testament of the Bible. He didn't know that he himself would write down letters that would be included in the New Testament of the Bible, but devout Jew Saul would become a Jesus follower just a little while later. And that shows us that ordinary people filled with the Spirit of God can do everything that an apostle can do. John 16, 7, Jesus actually told his disciples, he says, he says you know, it's, gonna, it's good that I leave. Like, I'm going to go, and that's going to be a good thing. And they're like, what are you talking about? And then he goes even further. He says, you will do greater things than I can even do. And now they've seen Jesus do amazing things. And they're just like, how's that even possible? I mean, it sounds absurd when Jesus says it, that it's like an absurd statement on the surface. But for all of you that do serve in an area of ministry, like how awesome would it be to have Jesus on your team, like in the flesh, Jesus on your ministry team. So like if you serve in the parking lot and all of a sudden a bunch of cars come in at once or all of a sudden the lot's getting full, I mean, how many people could Jesus park in that lot, right? He could park probably more than all of us, right? If somebody was supposed to bring cookies on a Sunday night but all of a sudden got sick at the last minute or they forgot them in the freezer, I mean, you just say, hey, Jesus, you're on the baking team, come over here, and then bam, the best chocolate chip cookies you've ever had in your life, they're there, right? If you're in a disciple maker group with three or four people and, and all of a sudden someone asks this, this challenging theological question, you're like, wow, that blows your mind. If Jesus was in your disciple maker group, you say, well, what do you think? And Jesus could answer it in a way that gives you a hundred more questions, right? Because he just blows your mind. If, if some kid eats a peanut in Takuma Island that has a peanut allergy, you just call Jesus back in Takuma Island or Tiny Steps and then boom, they're healed, right? I mean, somebody runs over your dog and you just call Jesus who's on your greeting team and he comes by and resurrects your dog. It's great. If, somebody, if something happens to your cat, you call Jesus. He comes over with a shovel. He helps you dig the hole, you know? Whatever it is, he's there to help. Saul was there. Sorry, cat people, I'm just joking. <laughs> Saul was there when Stephen presented the gospel. <coughs> Stephen wasn't a pastor. He wasn't in church. He was in an incredibly oppressive environment. 
And he was just sharing from his heart with deep conviction what had changed his life. And Saul, a man who was actively repressing the spread of the gospel. Yet God was actively drawing Saul to himself. To change his life so Saul could become Paul and change the world. He was there when Stephen was sharing. Who might be standing near you this week or next month? And your story of what Jesus has done in your life could be the very seeds God uses to draw them to his grace. I mean, we never know the potential or legacy of those around us, not even really our kids. We never know how our faith walk, our faith testimony can be used by God when we share it. But we do know what will happen if we stay silent. Nothing. I mean, Stephen was there. He was surrounded by the big wigs. He was an ordinary guy who stood under extreme pressure and became an extraordinary influence in the move of God across the first century. You know, as we continue to take steps as a church outside of our comfort zone and be, continue to dream or ask God what this could look like of Fusion Community Church's ministry expand and becoming multiple locations, and planting a church or campus, it's going to take a lot of Stevens and Marys and Marthas that step forward into a calling God has for them. And we've been talking about for a while now four specific ways you can respond and say, okay, God, I'm willing to pray, I'm willing to go, I'm, I'm willing to lead, I'm willing to give. God has a next step for you. It's not the next step for everybody. But if you indicate it on, if you pull out your communication card right on the back, you can check a box, God, I commit to pray or, or I'm committing to go and, and explore what it would be like to be a part of a, a, a launch team for a new campus of a congregation somewhere in our region. Or maybe you'd say, I feel like God might be tapping me on the shoulder to lead. I mean, one of the great models we see in Stephen is, is he had great leadership ability and it started with serving food at tables. You can't lead at the next level if you're not willing to serve food at tables. So the mark of a Christian is a heart to serve. Nothing is more valuable than God's word. God does his greatest works through ordinary everyday people. And finally, the fourth lesson we see from Stephen's life is not an easy one to swallow. Sometimes God's will for us is martyrdom. Stephen did everything right and he ended up dead. What happened? Why didn't God bless him and reward him for, for his courage and faith? Grow his ministry, expand his influence, multiply his days on earth. I mean, we seem to have this idea sometimes that if our, in our heads, that if we do everything right, if we're obedient, if we honor God and follow him where he leads, then, then things go easy for us and we'll get what we want. The reality is that's just not a biblical idea in a fallen, broken, sinful world that is massively, massively fractured. There is nothing reliable in this broken world. So why did God allow Stephen to be killed just for standing strong about his faith? Well, I don't know the answer to that, but I can point to two things that I see throughout history now looking back that God did through allowing the course, the, the way for, for things to play out the way in which they did. The first one is Stephen's death was like gasoline on the spread of the gospel in the first century. Exponential growth went to a whole new level across the entire Roman Empire, exploded out from Jerusalem after this, as, and it got harder and harder at the same time to be a Christian in that culture for three centuries. I mean, it was as if the more pressure they applied to people who were disciples of Jesus, the more people wanted to sign up to have the pressure put on them to become disciples of Jesus. It's just completely counterproductive in every way, shape, and form. It just doesn't make sense, and yet that's what happened. Why did God allow this? The second thing I can point to is that Saul was there. He was present. He was watching. And Saul, when they came and they laid their, their outer garments at the feet of Saul, I mean, you can almost imagine a line forming as they were taking Stephen out. Saul standing there, a young man, a devout Jewish leader with so much potential and promise for the future. You could almost see a line developing as they're taking off their outer garments and Saul looking them in the eye one at a time and just shaking his head in affirmation. This is the right thing to do to stop the spread of the gospel. I mean, that's who was there. That was the heart of Saul. And as every stone smashed into his face and his body was mangled into a bloody heap, Saul was an eyewitness and an affirmative voice 
over Stephen's execution. But Saul also heard Stephen's cries. And we have no idea what kind of seed this planted in Saul's life. Because when Stephen began to cry after the rocks began to hit him, he didn't cry out, God, rescue me. Set me free from this. He didn't, re- he didn't cry out, God, strike vengeance. Bring justice against them. He didn't cry, okay, I don't believe anymore. I, I, I admit I was lying. It's not true. He didn't say any of that. What he said, Saul witnessed a man who was being attacked with rocks, hurled at every part of his body. And he saw Stephen endure a horrific act of violence. And what he heard was he heard Stephen cry out, Father, forgive them because they just don't know what they're doing. Don't hold this sin against them, God. And he saw the glory of God on Saul's face as his countenance changed. And something happened in Saul's heart that he would never get over because he carried that experience with him. So much so that much later in Acts chapter 22, Saul would reference that day. He would refer back to the day where he stood in approval of the execution of Stephen. And we don't know enough. It's not captured in the pages of scripture how significant that day stuck with Saul. But what we do know is Saul came to know Jesus. And God used that day and what what he witnessed, the confidence and courage and faith of Stephen to break something loose in Saul's heart. To where Saul would identify that act as representing how big of a sinner he is. How mixed up and backwards he was. You know, Stephen's most effective contribution to the kingdom of God came through his martyrdom. It's almost as if Stephen's blood being spilt on the ground were the very seeds of the Apostle Paul's salvation. That he witnessed it. And it's maybe more powerful that God didn't rescue Stephen from that execution because Saul carried the responsibility for that decision with him. He saw him full of the Holy Spirit, testifying to Jesus' glory in the midst of the most overwhelming circumstance. So how does that apply to our lives? Well, do you realize that your life preaches to all those around you? You preach in the way that you act. You preach in the way that you react. You preach through your behavior. You preach through your priorities. You preach to your kids what's most important by how you spend your time. You preach through your success. Who's to blame for your success? Who's to blame for the big bank account, for the financial security? Who gets credit for that degree? Who does the world revolve around? You preach through failures, mistakes, and pains. Who do you hold on to when nothing else seems to make sense? Who do you turn to for counsel or direction? What or who do you trust in? When you don't know what comes next. The sermons you preach through your pain are louder than the ones you preach through your blessings. From start to finish, Stephen's life screams one reality. It's not about me. It's not about me. It's not about me getting the respect I think I deserve. It's about serving and waiting tables if that's where the need exists. It's not about me obtaining blessing and getting favor and walking in prosperity. No, it's about me carrying Jesus wherever I am, no matter what I face. I mean, Stephen banked his life on the good news, the gospel, showing us that those who believe and grip hold of the gospel become good news to the rest of the world. So do you have a heart and a strong desire to serve? And you could say, yeah, I love serving at church. It has to start at home. Do you have a heart that is yielded and surrendered to serve your spouse, to serve your kid? They don't deserve it. You don't deserve it. To serve your enemy. It's easy to serve your friends. Do you have a heart of service to your enemy, to your church? Are you devoted to and diving into God's word? Do you believe that no matter how ordinary you might think you are, do you really believe God sees you as extraordinary and just like Stephen, he can do great things through someone who's serving food? And do you see now that perhaps God might be able to do his greatest work in you and through you because of the suffering or difficulties you've experienced? When you really dive in and probe the pages of scripture, that is one of the most constant themes Is through pain and suffering, God does his greatest work through ordinary men and women. Would you pray with me? Father God, we're so grateful that Acts chapter 6 and 7 are included in your word. 
I mean, God, I can't imagine the book of Acts. I can't imagine stepping back and looking at the first century church without knowing about Stephen. I mean, his life, I mean, we could just spend an entire series looking at this man and the words he spoke, the words he spoke about the gospel, the good news, and and who Jesus was and what God was trying to accomplish and the prophets and and Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and the fall in the garden. I mean, he's he's just brilliant. What you what you brought to his mind to present to the religious leaders of his day. And God, we rack our minds to think, how could it end that way? And yet when we look, we, we see how you took something the enemy intended for evil and you turned it to good. God, we're blown away that in a dark, broken, flawed world, we're blown away that you can bring good or light out of any of it, yet you do all the time. God, I don't know what the next step is for every person that's gathered here tonight. But I know it's something, it's some area of increased trust or faith in you. So would you make that abundantly clear to us? That it might correspond with this next season in the life of our church. It might be more directly connected to these practical lessons from Stephen's life. Would you make it abundantly clear to us, Lord? In your holy and awesome name we pray. Amen.